Hey there, and welcome to Large Format Friday. I'm your host, Matt Mirage. If this is the first time you're stopping by the channel, there's a playlist of our entire fourth season of LFF. If you haven't subscribed yet, each and every Friday, we're gonna be here and we're gonna be chatting about something large format. Over the past couple of years, I really drilled on and on about the importance of exposure for your large format photography. I still think that is one of the most critical steps but equally as important and something I really haven't touched on too much, maybe all the way back to season one, is the importance of developing your large format sheet films. Now, development doesn't necessarily change when we're working in large format, but one of the largest advantages of large format is the ability to control our development for each and every sheet. Our large format exposures aren't stuck on the same roll as multiple other exposures. This means we can have individualized control over that development. Oh, by the way, you still have a couple weeks left to sign up for the undo pinhole. You don't have to be subscribed, but check out the link below for details. And if you have a friend that uh, could use a really nice handcrafted pinhole camera, send them this link, send them this video. They probably wanna learn about development anyway. Anywho. Large format sheet films have the distinct advantage of being treated separately if you, the photographer, wishes to. This means that if I determine through my metering that one shot needs more or less development than another, as long as I mark it properly on the holder, once I get here in the darkroom, I can cater that development. This means that I can get exactly the thing I'm looking for from shot to shot to shot. Without good exposure and some good notes, uh, a lot of what we're talking about today isn't gonna matter. I would say exposure is the first 60% of this equation. Before we get started working in the darkroom on that last 40%, some of the first things we're gonna wanna have a good lock on are our camera equipment. We wanna make sure our camera's reliable, good accurate shutter speeds, and we're working with a film we're relatively comfortable with and probably have a few sheets of. If you haven't checked it out yet, back in season three, I outlined some film testing procedures. This is an optional step, but I think it really helps in dialing in your exact developing process. So during that film testing episode, I outlined the steps to find your personal EI or exposure index, AKA your ISO. ISO isn't some sort of magical number, it's just a reference point. It says, if I base my exposure off of this number, the right combination of shutter speed and aperture is gonna start to produce the right density when I start developing it in the darkroom. That's all it means. After a bit of testing, photographers will often find their personal EI is a little bit lower than what is box speed. If you haven't tested, don't worry, you don't need to. You can just go with box speed from here on out. But as long as your exposure is trustworthy, you can check it with a meter or your phone or another digital camera, that's gonna be great. Now, what I'm gonna be talking about today is most applicable to black and white film processing, but you can apply some of these principles to color. If you're sending these off to the lab, these are still good notes to have and good practices to keep as you give these notes over to somebody in your lab. Labs are gonna to wanna to know how to process it. Are we gonna do normal? Are we gonna do push processing? Are we gonna do pull processing? So before we head in the darkroom and talk a little bit more about the nitty gritty and developing, let's kind of recap what's exposure doing to our film. Well, when we have our correct exposure index and the right amount of exposure, we're creating a latent image on our sheet of freshly exposed film. There's just enough photons to excite the emulsion that uh, it's gonna hold that latent image until we get it into the darkroom. When that film hits the developer at the right time, temperature, dilution, and pH, we start to see little bits of density form. The energy of those photons being held in the emulsion as we reduce it to metallic silver is gonna cause clumping. And those little black bits, or tan bits in the case of this, will clump proportionally to the amount of exposure they receive. Now, this is where things get a little tricky. Film doesn't have the same type of response that maybe a digital camera does. If you've ever worked with an unprocessed raw picture from a digital camera, you might notice the picture looks mm, a little bit flat. That's because the response of a digital sensor is a completely straight line. Many times to get that pop or that extra look out of it, we have to apply a curve. And usually that curve has a bit of an S shape to it. Every film emulsion, on the other hand, already has a little bit of a look baked into it, also known as a characteristic curve. This S-shaped curve is carved out into three distinct places. The bottom area of the curve, where everything's kind of clumped together, that's called the toe. The very top of that S-curve uh, is where our highlight region starts to kind of block up. We call this the shoulder. That straight line bit in the center, that's the part that we're aiming for. So, 
Film and digital are two halves of the same coin. With digital, we're trying to take a straight line response and apply a curve to it. Whereas when we work with film, we have a curve and we're trying to flatten that curve out and give it a more straight line response. This is a sheet of film I shot last winter during season two of LFF in one of my field work episodes. In foggy settings, it's often that I will push my development. I'll add extra time to it to get me some extra density in the highlights. In this case, I had a good amount of overexposure applied as well as a normal development time. And this is what it looked like. So the dense parts of this negative are the parts that have kind of this darker tan color and the thinner parts of the negative look like the rebate of the film and we can see almost all of that white light coming through it. Film will also have a small amount of density in that film, uh, in that rebate portion. We call this film base plus fog. All films and all developers will give us this, but depending on your film, you may have more or less of this base fog. Expired films will have a whole heck of a lot more base fog than fresh films. So if we wanna make sure all of our negatives are really nice and even, we have to start with some good notes in the field. A good amount of exposure to give us that shadow detail is only one part of it. We also need to refer to those meter readings to see how far apart our shadows with detail and our highlights with detail are. If your shadows with fine detail are four to five stops from your highlights that you want with detail, you're in good luck. All you have to do is use some normal processing time. If you know your personal EI, go with that normal processing time based on your EI. If you're going by box speed, go with the manufacturer's recommended settings with the developer of your choice. If you find that the highlights that you've metered are actually closer to those shadows with detail, that's okay. You're dealing with a relatively flat scene. Flat scenes just means that there's low contrast in the scene you're photographing. Typically, to get the look you want out of it the way your eye sees it, we're going to have to expand that development. That means we're cooking the film a little bit longer than we otherwise would. So we're gonna mark our film for a plus development, known as N plus. The amount of steps plus that we're gonna use is all dependent on how many stops we are away. If we're three to four stops from that shadow to highlight, we probably want an N plus one. If it's even tighter, like super flat, like you're shooting pages of a book or something, you may want to do up to an N plus two. Anything beyond that is very extreme and I can only think of maybe one or two scenarios in the thousands of pictures I've taken where I've needed to apply more extreme push processing measures. So N plus is another way to think of push processing. So let's say you just metered out a really flat scene uh, that's only about three stops from that shadow to highlight with detail. You need to push that about one f-stop. We need to mark the exposure we took with an N plus one. We can do that with stickers, labels, or if you have notch holders like we talked about in season three, you can also mark that in your notes. But either way, we need to know once this gets in the darkroom, we're gonna give it extended development. Now the length of that developing time is gonna depend on your own process, but generally each stop that we add or each zone that we expand our development to is gonna be about 25 to 30% extra time from our N or normal processing time. Let's take, for example, I don't know, FPP Frankenstein 200, like we talked about a couple weeks ago. This stuff develops out crazy fast, about four minutes in HC 110 dilution B at 20 degrees Celsius, and it's a nice round number. So if four minutes is my normal processing time, an N plus one processing time would be about five minutes. On the other side of it, if I had a really contrasty exposure, one with six or more stops between my shadow with detail and my highlight with detail, I may want to consider an N minus one or a pull development. What this is gonna do is we're giving adequate exposure so those shadows don't come out empty, but we need to tame that development so those highlights don't get way, way, way too far apart. We're trying to normalize the dynamic range of the scene to the more limited dynamic range of our materials. So to recap, normal processing time is what you see from the manufacturer based on the box speed or your own personal EI that you've tested for with a step wedge. Normal plus time, also known as push processing, is when you extend that development time, typically 25 to 30% per stop. And N minus, or pull developing, is when you take the film out of the developer a little bit sooner. This is usually also 25 to 30% less than that total N processing time. While 
N and N plus processing times are fairly common with zone system process in black and white. In my opinion, N minus times aren't as necessary due to how awesome our modern working materials are. That's just my opinion. If you wanna go by and do extreme pull processes, anytime I've tried anything more than like an N minus one, it's usually ended up pretty bad for my shadow information when just overexposing and then printing down or compensating and scanning was a great job. Another question I get pretty often about push and pull processing with film is how do I handle it? What if I'm shooting a lot of film and maybe I don't have a lot of film holders or I'm on vacation, I'm traveling. One of my best recommendations for keeping track of your film, especially when traveling, is to have empty film boxes. Uh, I always keep my film boxes, try to keep the triple clamshell, the light tight bags, even those little cardboard dividers in there, they really help in separating your film and you can mark on the box. Uh, a lot of my boxes will have many, you know, many pieces of tape and little stickers pulled off of holders. That's great. All it's there for is to keep it separate and to have something that marks, okay, all of my extended development is in this box, all of my normal and pull development are over there. Some things that we need to take as a given in a darkroom setting are temperature control and pH control. If you don't have a constant lock on that temperature for processing, you're gonna have a wide range of variability and you're not gonna get consistent results. This is a chemical process. It doesn't happen in a straight line fashion, it happens in a logarithmic fashion. So at colder and colder temperatures, it pretty much stops. And as it, things get warmer, it proceeds faster and faster and faster until uh, it's just uncontrollable and the results are not too great. So get temperature under control. Uh, if you need to temper that, uh, you can look into things like the FPP heat helper, which is like an immersion circulator uh, to keep a bath of water warm or something like a phototherm or a Jobo, which is tempered, but also has a spinning drum for a little bit more consistency. Now for thermometer control, we have a couple options. We can go with an old school dial thermometer, which is fine. These will take a while to come up to temperature or down, or we can do one of these instant readout infrared thermometers. These, as it gets really, really cold, may be hard to tell the difference between the surface and what's down in the solution, but they're quick and these are getting way, way, way less expensive thanks to uh, COVID-19, so there's a positive. When it comes to keeping your pH on lock, if you've never worked with a certain developer or you're still getting to know it, I recommend isolating some more variables by mixing everything with distilled water. Distilled water is relatively inexpensive uh, at a lot of local supermarkets. If you trust your water supply or if you've tested for your very own water supply, you're good to go. So knowing those characteristics of your local water supply will also affect development. When you start testing out a developer for your personal use, I recommend working with the lowest dilution. So in HC110, this would be dilution A or B, or in, uh, in my personal one, Pyrocat HD, I like doing the standard one part A, one part B, 100 parts water. I can always increase that, but if I want good consistent results, I'm probably gonna have to test for it or understand that you may love the results you get from changing temperature uh, or dilution instead of time, but take good notes and I recommend testing it if you do get results you like so you can repeat that. This is all about getting control over that process. Once you can control this part, it's just like moving those sliders uh, in your digital editing software. Extending and pulling back development are changing the contrast of your film. When we expand our development, we are pulling that contrast further apart. This is like taking your contrast slider and moving it to the plus. Now you will wanna take some of, these, uh, some of these rules with a grain of salt because if you're not doing darkroom printing, you can make some of these adjustments via scanning, but it's different. I'm not gonna say one is better than the other, but I found knowing both steps and applying them to the best of my ability gives me all the versatility I need. A lot of my negatives tend to be a little bit more dense. This allows me the ability to make a silver gelatin print uh, while having it under the enlarger for a longer exposure, but it also allows me to scan these up really well. And when I do those alternative photographic processes with my UV printer, I have a negative that can work well for all three. Part of narrowing down this process and doing this push and pull development is an effort to gain control over what your negatives look like. How your negatives look are gonna be based on your output, whether you're scanning, printing, alternative process, all of it applies, but it may need to change your process. So be aware of that. You know, I can't quite put my finger on it, but something about this process seems eerily familiar. We're dealing with precise measurements time, temperature, sometimes even dilution. Sounds a lot like baking. Let's get to it.
You know, I wasn't always good at film photography, and I wasn't always good at baking either. It wasn't until I really slowed down, read the, followed the instructions a few times, and kind of found my own groove that it really all started to come together. Baking is a lot the same way. You're probably going to mess something up if you've never done it before, so follow the instructions. Right now I'm mixing my dry ingredients. Once I get those measured out, I'm going to move to the wet ingredients. About a cup and a half. Sifting through the dry, give it a little bit of air. There we go. After that, I'm going to add a teaspoon and a half of baking powder. It's going to help them rise. There we go. And a half. There we go. Mix that around a little bit. Pinch of salt. And we can't forget the sugar. Got to keep it sweet. Most baked goods are going to have a dry component and a wet component, much like our two biggest factors with our film exposure are aperture and shutter speed. It took me a while to get used to this trick. This is some frozen butter. Nice and chill so it doesn't get melty on me. I want it to melt in the oven. Not right now. My stick of butter. I'm going to start shredding it up. And if I shred this long enough, we should have some guests joining us. Yeah, I know. You want the butter. Look at you, you vultures. Looking for your butters. I know this seems like a lot, but this is a delectable sweet. We're going to need a whole half stick of this butter. And give this a nice little stir. Now to add our main flavor. Let's add a good amount of our cranberries. A little bit of tart. And a little bit of our semi-sweet. And this concludes all of our dry ingredients. Let's move to the wet. Just like our dry ingredients, we're going to be really precise with our wet ingredients. Go for a half cup of milk here and a teaspoon of vanilla. We can always add more wet ingredients, but we can't take it away. This can imbalance our bake, just like having an improper exposure can force us to make other concessions later on. With this particular batch of scones, I don't want it to be too dry, and I definitely don't want it too wet. A little bit like film photography, sometimes it helps to get in there with our hands. Next, I'm going to get my baking sheet. Form it into nice little triangles here. Grip and grip. Just like that. Here's one. This recipe should yield five really hearty or six medium-sized scones. And we're going to take these and pop them into a preheated 420 degree oven. We'll see you in 20 minutes. I know what you're thinking. These are actually great for baking too. Don't, don't tell me you don't do this at home. We all do this. So in wrapping everything we talked about up today, Development of your film, especially black and white, is just as important as the exposure itself. When you're working with large format films, the strict advantage that you have is you can cater the development specifically to each sheet if you so choose. The various ways that we can handle our processing times, N, N plus, known as push, N minus, known as pull, those can change our final contrast of the image and give us that extra layer of creative control, maybe a little bit harder than we could with digital, but they work very similarly. I also want to take a moment to thank all of our LFF sustaining members. It's thanks to folks like you that I can take this extra effort, uh, run around with the car, go home and make, uh, make one of my scone recipes. Oh, and by the way, this scone recipe isn't quite my own. The main instructions for those were actually created by a fellow film shooter. 
through a lot of trial and error, I was able to arrive at a process that I really enjoyed and a scone that's pretty darn delicious. Oh, by the way, I got something for you. Go ahead, take a bite. They're still fresh. Oh yeah, look at that scone. Look at that sugar action. Oh, so delicious. I'm so good. I'm thinking of scone. Who doesn't love a dry scone? Oh, cranberry and chocolate in there. It's perfect. Oh yeah, this is the spot. I gotta take another bite of this. Oh my goodness. If you have any questions about the large format photographic process, you can feel free to drop those down below in the comments. And for those long form questions, give me a little bit of time, but I'd be happy to answer your email, largeformatquestions at gmail.com. Thanks again for stopping by, and we'll catch you next week for more LFF.